come to a place like this for solitude. But we find that physical solitude is not enough, even when you're sitting alone under the trees. You've got your companions. And the Buddha says our primary companion is craving. This is why we have all those dialogues in the mind. Desire for this, desire to be, to gain something, to be something, not to be something. It's because of these desires that we take on all the kind of different identities in the mind, all the different voices. You can get involved in all kinds of dialogues, taking on different parts, different roles, arguing back and forth, or one side of the mind encouraging another side of the mind, going back and forth that way as well. This really destroys any peace and quiet you're going to find in the mind, unless you train those voices. Many times we think that meditation means not having any voices in the mind at all, kind of snuffing out thought entirely. You can't get to thought, freedom from thought without learning how to think in more skillful ways, to encouraging more skillful voices in the mind, more skillful dialogues in the mind. So that's one of the important skills in the meditation as well. We're not just here to focus on the breath. You find that being able to be on the with the breath helps pull you out of a lot of dialogues by creating a new dialogue focused around the breath. But then through the force of old habits you find yourself being pulled back into old dialogues with your parents, your old friends, all sorts of inner voices. And so in addition to learning how to stay with the breath as a way of pulling you out of the dialogues from time to time and give you some perspective, you've also got to learn how to create, to deal with those voices. So when a particular voice comes up arguing strongly for some particular thing, you have to look at it. This is really skillful. This is going to be a useful voice to, to identify with. If not, you've got to deal with it in other ways sidestep it, argue with it sometimes, because the voice represents an attitude that you've internalized someplace, and that the voice is simply allowed to go on speaking from that perspective, from that attitude, without being challenged. It's going to sneak in your thoughts in other ways as well. One of the paradoxes of meditating is that as things grow more and more quiet in the mind, the opportunity for old issues comes bubbling up even more than normal sometimes, or at least you sense it more than normal. Actually, the old issues are constantly bubbling up. It's just that they get distorted into the issues of your day-to-day -day life. So that an old issue, say, from childhood comes up and it gets warped into playing a role in a current day-to-day -day issue. You don't see it as the old issue coming back again. But when you come out here and get some physical solitude, those old issues come bubbling up and you see them clearly for what they are, old things coming back. The question is, do you want yourself to be shaped by those old things? Well, no. You want to have some more freedom. Part of the freedom lies with staying with the breath and just not getting involved. Other times you do have to get involved. It's like dealing with people you don't like. As the Buddha said, there are five ways of dealing with people you don't like. One is to try to develop thoughts of goodwill, another is trying to get, develop thoughts of compassion, thoughts of equanimity, paying them no mind and no attention, and then reflecting on the principle of karma, that if you get involved with them. It's just going to be an endless round. Whatever they may have done to you it probably can be traced back to some old karma of yours. So the reflection on the principle of karma pulls you out. That's dealing with people you don't like. It's sim similar issues in dealing with voices in the mind you don't like. Sometimes you simply develop equanimity, telling yourself it doesn't matter what the old voice is like. 
let it chatter on. If you don't get involved with it, it'll stop chattering after a while. That's one kind of voice. Other kinds of voices are more insistent, but you really have to take them apart, analyze them, to see what attitudes they're expressing, and then try to replace those attitudes with goodwill, compassion, equanimity. Another way of dealing with them is to realize that if, as long as you take on the identity of those voices, you're creating karma. Do you want to identify as I've identified with them? Is that the kind of karma you want to create? If not, you have the choice not to identify with them, not to go running along with them. So lots of different approaches for dealing with these internal voices, these internal roles. But it comes down to the question, is that dialogue a useful dialogue to get involved with right now? And if the answer is no, you've got to deal, deal with it. Extract yourself from it. Sometimes simply reminding yourself of the breath is enough. Other times you have to think about the drawbacks. Where is this particular dialogue going to take you? Remember, it is a form of karma. Is that the kind of karma you want to take on? And remind yourself you have the choice not to. So many times we think that because something comes up in the mind, it's our responsibility. We've got to deal with it. And that's not always the case. The nature of the mind, the nature of your old karma, is to keep stirring things up. And you have the choice to get involved or not get involved. And this is why we have the breath, is to give you a place to step out so you don't have to be involved. Just be with the physical side of your field of awareness, the side that you can identify as breath energy or the solid parts of the body or the other elements. Because this range of awareness we have here is kind of like light. Sometimes light behaves like particles, and other times it seems to behave like waves. The old joke is that light, light is particles on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and it's waves on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. It takes the day off on Sunday. And your field of awareness, though, is like that. Not Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but you can choose to focus on your awareness as corresponding to physical sensations or as corresponding to mental acts. And one would get, what good way of simply clearing the air is to get into the physical side as much as you can. That's why when the Buddha is talking about ways of dealing with distractions, and the ultimate one where you can't extract your way from a particular distraction through discernment, you just force yourself out of it as you get very physical, tongue on the roof of your mouth, clenching your teeth, reestablish the physicality of your present awareness. And from there you get into the breath. You can then you can begin to relax the clenching, relax the force. But think of the breath as something viscous. It's not going to turn back into thoughts again. This range of your awareness stays physical. Identify it clearly. This, these are your hands, these are your feet, these are your legs. Stay with the physical side of your frame of awareness, or range of awareness. That we can step out of the dialogues. You don't have to get involved. So there are lots of tools for dealing with these dialogues. But the primary one is realizing that you don't want to get involved in them. Some dialogues you've had with your parents that go on for years and years and years. Or voices you've picked up from other people from your childhood. They're still in there. And they've managed to become part of your identity, or part of the many identities inside you. And the same old stuff over and over and over again. And seeing that, these are just old movies. And you know how they're going to turn out. You've seen them many, many times. And where do they go? They go nowhere. And in some bad cases, they cause you to create new karma. Is that what you want? Well, no. Once you realize you don't want to get involved in those voices, don't want to identify with them, then you're ready to find the way out. And that's when the Buddha offers you his next line of defense, which are the various tools we've talked about. So part of it is the determination not to 
keep falling back into those old roles. And then secondly, is once you've got that determination, he's got tools for you to pry yourself loose. So you have the choice. Sitting here, you can either have all these companions, or you can have the singularity of just being with the breath, your whole body, just breath. As different aspects of breath energy. And always keep in mind that that choice is always there. Then once you're established in the breath, then you can turn around and look and see which of these voices is actually useful. Or you can start analyzing the process of how you take on their identity. But that requires subtlety. Because otherwise it's all too easy when you start looking at these voices and looking at the dialogues, you get sucked back into them all over again. You find that happening, go back to the breath. But over the course of time, you find as you get more firmly established with the breath and more skilled at pulling out when you get sucked into things, then you're ready to start analyzing them, taking them apart, seeing where the element of craving and clinging and becoming create these dialogues in the mind. So that you're carrying around your companions all the time. Then you can start taking them apart and you don't have to have the companions. Your frame of reference is right here. And this way you can pull yourself out of all those punishing dialogues you have. The dialogues that make you miserable, and then when you're miserable it spills out to the people around you. And when you're creating less suffering from yourself, the people around you suffer less as well. This is a lot of where the suffering comes from. So have a sense of the range of tools that are available to you. And remind yourself of the possibility of not having to identify with these voices. For a lot of people, just that possibility, the possibility of choice, is revolutionary. And then from the choice, you develop the skills to implement that choice, to free yourself. And that way you come to real solitude, free not only of the chatter of people outside, but free from chatter of people inside. Once you learn not to identify with the chatter inside, then the chatter outside doesn't get to you at all. It's this habit we have of identifying with these voices. You start hearing other people talking outside, you identify with those as well. You start talking along with them. But when you stop chattering with, along with the voices inside, then the voices outside don't really bother you. This is why the Buddha ultimately said that mental solitude is something you can have anywhere once you've really developed it. When you're free of those companions, the clinging and craving and becoming, even if just temporarily. But if you know the skill of how to get there, that enables you to be free wherever you are, not encumbered. Have solitude wherever you are, no matter how many people around you. So this is where the work has to be done for lifting off our burdens. and sorting out the clutter we find in our lives.